But now, rather than just focusing on what to not eat, now I'm focusing on what I have to eat. When I became well enough that I was traveling, uh, Drew, and I couldn't get that huge volume of vegetables, within 24 hours, my energy would start tanking. My mental clarity would start tank tanking. Then I had this really big aha moment. Like, what if I take this uh, list of things I'm taking in supplement form, and I figure out where they're at in the food supply. And I restructure my paleo diet to stress those particular nutrients. That food's probably a lot more complicated than supplements. That if I reorganize my diet, maybe I'd get some, some other things that'd be good for me. So I uh, go ask my uh, dietitian friends, uh, I, I take in my list of nutrients, and they throw up their hands and say, like, you know, we, I, we need a, a dietetic intern to help you. I, 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 I don't know. So then I go over to the, pub, the um, uh, health sciences library and talk to librarians, and they aren't really that helpful either. I, and then I go back to Google, and I discover the Linus Pauling uh, Institute on Micronutrients, and that's a gold mine. So now I have the food sources for all these key nutrients. And I have these list of foods I'm going to start emphasizing in my diet. Now, mind you, I've already been meticulously gluten-free, dairy-free, because I'm doing the AIP protocol uh, per um, uh, Dr. Cordain. But now, rather than just focusing on what to not eat, now I'm focusing on what I have to eat. Uh, and in that period of time that you were going dairy-free and gluten-free, just like with the original supplements, I know there's a lot of different things that are going on. Did you notice that that improved things not at all. slightly? Not at all. Not, not at, all. at all. And so you might ask, so why did I stay with it? I figured like, well, you know, my brain, was, I clearly had been ill for quite a while. I clearly had a very aggressive disease. I did not know how long it would take um, for, for things to repair. At least I was doing something. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I wanted to be doing something. And so I stayed with it. I added supplements, and I wasn't getting stronger with my supplements. But I did figure out I was uh, better with them than without them, and it was slowing my decline. Right. And so March, uh, pardon me, December 26th, I started this new way of eating, we had salmon, we had a big kale salad, uh, we had a lot of garlic in it, we had some ginger in it, uh, we had um, berries, although I don't quite remember which berries it, it was. Um, and then we uh, made some other vegetables, uh, probably cauliflower. All reverse engineered from you looking at that database, that database of micronutrients. What were some of the examples of like some of the key things? I mean, you just mentioned some, but what were some examples to compare and contrast that were not really in your diet, even though you were gluten free? So I, I wasn't eating liver. You know, so I was back. By God, I was going to have liver once or twice a week. Um, I was make, also want to be sure I was having heart. Um, I uh, was much more meticulous about having only uh, organic food, only uh, wild caught um, uh, or uh, wild caught fish or uh, grass fed, grass finished meat. Uh, and uh, if it was not uh, organic, uh, I was not going to eat it. So in a way to, to zoom out a little bit big picture, because diet is so central as part of your protocol, even though you were doing paleo before, it was primarily what meats to not eat. from what to not eat, and also meats from sort of muscle proteins instead yeah, it was, of it was looking muscle at muscle protein. Uh, I wasn't organ meats. I wasn't organ meats. Uh, it wasn't bone broth. Um, you know, it, and in uh, retrospect, when, uh, when I look back at my youth, I'd had uh, a lot of tonsillitis uh, age three, tonsils out age four. Uh, probably had a lot of antibiotics, uh, yeast overgrowth, and dysbiosis. Uh, leaky gut, uh, severe gluten sensitivity, uh, and that although I'd been gluten-free, dairy-free, um, I probably had not healed my leaky gut. Right. So a lot of different foods would trigger that. Correct. So when um, I uh, added the organ meat uh, and the bone broth, uh, likely I healed that leaky gut. Now, the other, the other thing, uh, some other really interesting observations, uh, when I started 
uh, adding all this kale and uh, cooked greens, I discovered I had this uh, incredible craving of cooked greens uh, and greens. So when people uh, get shocked, they talk like nine cups of vegetables. Like, Terry, how, how can you possibly do nine cups Which of vegetables? Which is the recommendation inside of your protocol. We haven't gotten into it yet, but it's like, it's a big emphasis on like nine cups of vegetables yeah. every day. Yeah, you know, it's a way of thinking uh, of about merging the best parts of the Mediterranean diet and the paleo diet. So yeah. you end up with something that, something that looks uh, a bit like the uh, Walls diet. Um, but the nine cups is actually much less than what I was doing. I was probably having nine cups of greens plus uh, the additional vegetables. Um, and when I became well enough that I was traveling, uh, Drew, and I couldn't get that huge volume of vegetables, within 24 hours, my energy would start tanking. My mental clarity would start tank tanking. Now, the the science has sort of caught up, or, I, or I've discovered the science more, that um, vitamin K uh, turns out to have a huge role in myelin, in myelin repair, in brain stem cells. And for those listeners on the podcast that aren't familiar with the role that myelin plays in the body, what can you explain that? Oh, sure. So um, the myelin is the fat wrapper around the wiring between brain cells. So if you have a nice uh, thick coating of myelin, the transmission is fast uh, and efficient. When the myelin breaks down um, and it can't be repaired well, then the transmission is slow and spotty. You're more likely to have uh, weakness, more likely to have sensory disturbance. So it, now, in retrospect, I would say that my intense craving for greens, once I began eating them and realized like I could not get enough, um, was probably uh, reflecting that when I had all those greens, the bacteria in my um, small intestine could help metabolize that into uh, K2 which would then be absorbed in my ileum, which would then go to my liver to be metabolized to K2MK4, which could then go up to my brain and uh, help support the oligodendrocyte precursor cells that help uh, make the uh, myelin. So sort of a long sequence there. Uh, so it was just uh, phenomenal, uh, the benefits of having all those greens. So you discovered the Institute of Functional Medicine. You're going even further. There's this emphasis on additional things of focusing what to eat, not just what not to eat. Mm -hmm. And if I could zoom out for a second, were you also getting a better understanding of what potentially were some of the factors that led to the buildup of having an autoimmune disease? Sure. Um, so... As I went through the neuroprotection course, that was really focused on mitochondria and the brain. Uh, and then uh, it wasn't actually until I recovered quite remarkably, and I'm going through more uh, IFM courses, that I'm really and, deeping my uh, understanding of the autoimmune process. And for anybody that's not familiar, we've mentioned it many times before, but the I IFM is the Institute of Functional Medicine. They're a nonprofit that educates practitioners all around the world. Many mm -hmm. of them are physicians or practitioners like yourself who've gotten sick at some point in time, like Dr. Hyman and many others. That's how nearly all of us get, get to uh, the Institute. There's this new generation of people who are coming in, like my brother-in-law who's a cardiologist in, in uh, San Diego, who are not sick because now there's so many authors like yourself who are teaching them. It's like young med students and individuals who are getting into it. But the first wave was literally doctors who were looking for an answer, could not find the answer or found a piece of the answer, got referred to IFM, and then began their additional training into the root factors that actually cause mm -hmm. health and cause yeah. disease. Correct, correct. Almost like a med school, you know, like a second you know, phase of it. So my my undergraduate degree is a Bachelor of Fine Arts in studio art painting. Um, and so I decided I was going to starve as an artist and I went back, picked up my science and applied to medical school, got in. Basic science was really hard, or way harder for me than many of my colleagues. I was so thrilled to be done with uh, biochemistry and physiology and so thrilled to discover it again uh, when I became ill and realized that that was going to be the key to my recovery. And so uh, it, it gives me a lot of smiles now and laughter to realize uh, I just love reading about biochemistry and physiology now 
in uh, immunology, neuroimmunology, because uh, those certainly were the keys to my recovery. So, you know, we're following this story, and just like everybody's listening so intently, let's continue on on the story. Okay, so December 26th, I start this new way of eating. You know, and January begins, I'm going to go off to this uh, new clinic that I have to be in, the traumatic brain injury clinic. And I'm, you know, assuming I can't do that job. It's going to be more physically demanding than what I can do. Uh, The first week, you know, it's the middle of January. Now I'm there, and I'm... I've just been watching my partners do these exams. Third week of January, okay, Terry, time for you to do the exams. So I'm uh, into three weeks of eating this way. I'm about ready to start my fourth week. I start seeing the patients. And you know, at the end of the first day, I'm like, well, that wasn't too bad. At the end of the week, I'm like, I, th- I can do this. And I realize something's happening. And uh, so it's with breathtaking speed, I'm beginning to realize, you know, my, my, I, my thinking's more clear. And then I realize, you know, my energy's better. And then I realize I don't have to sit in the zero gravity chair at home to have supper, I, I can sit in my other desk chair. I can, I can, I can sit upright. And then, um, I think it's about three months. I have a a piece of mail that I should uh, take down to the mailbox. Uh, it's probably about a oh the equivalent of, a, of about uh, half a block. I haven't done this for years at the VA. I pick up my uh, walking sticks, I put the letter in my pocket, and I walk to the mailbox, and I mail that letter. My colleagues see me in the hallway go like, oh my God, Dr. Walls, you're walking. <laughs> um, and then I start walking I leave my uh, wheelchair in the corner. I, um, I have a scooter. Uh, I take my wheelchair home, park that. Uh, and then in the garage, I have my uh, a scooter. I leave that in my office, but I'm not really using that. Uh, six months into all this. No, it's not quite six months. Maybe uh, four months, five months into this. Um, my every two-year follow-up with uh, my chair of internal medicine is due. And now that's a little bigger walk than just around the hospital. It's down a hill, up a hill. You know, it's maybe like half mile. That's clearly too far. So I get in my scooter. I'm driving my scooter over, and I'm going up the hill. It's, and you hear this motor go. Rrr, rrr, rrr. Oh, shit. So I get out. And I said, okay, what if I just walk next to it? So I get a few more feet, and that stops again. Then I uh, disengage the drive shaft and I push it up the hill. And then I, you know, get to the door and the um, uh, attendant offers to call me the, the patient mobile. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm already late to see the chair of medicine. I can't. How long? How, how long am I going to have to wait? So, oh, it's about half an hour. Like, oh, I can't do that. So just watch my scooter, and I finish the way walking getting to my chairman's office. The secretary is quite perturbed because now I am late. Uh, and uh, they usher me into the chairman's office and I apologize, tell him that my scooter died on the way over. He goes, oh, you had to wait for the patient mobile? So no, no, I, I pushed it up the hill and I walked over. Now he hadn't seen me in about nine months. The last time I had seen you, you were in a wheelchair. I was in a wheelchair and that looked really bad. Um, so I... I um, explained to him, he said, oh, so you must be taking Tizabri. I said, well, no, actually, I'm not. I actually, I'm off all my disease-modifying drugs with my neurologist's approval. I'm just using diet and lifestyle. And so I showed him my e-stem device, uh, told him my story, talked about what I was doing. And he, he's a rheumatologist, by the way. He says, Terry, this is so important. Your job for this year is to get a case report written up. Mm. I said, on myself? I said, yes. 
uh, work with your treating physician, your treating medical team. You get this written up. This is so important. People do not recover from progressive MS. Hmm. So um, I did that. Uh, and then um, he would call me back uh, uh, when I had that done. I thought I was done. He goes, no, now we're going to have you do a safety and feasibility study. So he would head, head me down that path. Uh, and then uh, a couple months later on, on Mother's Day, I um, we had a, a family meeting because I, I wanted to ride my bike. It was the first time in six years. Uh, and fortunately for me, the family, uh, Jackie said that we, we, I could. Um, I could try anyway. Uh, she'd have my son jog on the left. My daughter would jog on the right. She would follow up on the bike. And I was able to bike. And of course, that felt like um, a really quite miraculous uh, because that was something I completely accepted uh, would never happen again. And uh, so uh, when when that happened, um, certainly how I understood disease and health was very different. Uh, the way I practiced medicine would be different. Uh, and it actually, it was shortly after that that my chairman called me back and said, um, I want you to do a safety and feasibility trial. We're going to have you change the research that you do. Incredible. And I'm sure even for, in addition to the magnitude for yourself, just the magnitude for your family witnessing all this, for your partner, oh, we're for all your crying. kids. <laughs> we're all crying. We're all crying a lot. Yeah. And the joy of that, because anybody who knows somebody with uh how would you rank, I mean, how would you rank the severity of MS and progressive MS compared to like other autoimmune uh, diseases in terms of how much it affects the mobility of the body, body and how quickly sort of the decline is? Well, <clears throat> typically, um, you know, everyone is unique and it depends on what part of your body uh, is impacted. I, I got into really quite profound disability very quickly. It, is that typical, no, atypical? No, no. Well, I, was, I had much, much more aggressive. Yeah. Uh, for the newly diagnosed person, within 10 years, one third will have some kind of gait impairment, needing a cane, walker, or wheelchair. So within three years, I needed a wheelchair. Within seven years, I could not sit up like you are in, in this chair. I was not able to sit uh, up in a regular chair. I had to have a zero gravity chair or be in bed. By the zero gravity chair, I mean uh, one that lets me lie back so my knees are higher than my nose. Um, and I was beginning to have uh, brain fog. There's a lot more recognition that um, impaired thinking uh, begins to accrue. Uh, anxiety and depression can begin to accrue. Now, uh, there were some, a lot of fortunate things. My hands were still working well. And even though I've had uh, optic neuritis, and there's uh, clearly evidence of optic neuritis in both eyes, uh, my vision is still uh, really quite good. But So I want to zoom out because people have heard the term MS, and we'll come back to your story. But I want to do a little bit of a, what when you were a med student and you were learning about autoimmune conditions and diseases like MS, what were you taught about the fundamental reason that they happen inside the body? <laughs> and then yeah. as that journey continued and your research continued and you connected with IFM, how did that understanding grow further from there? So the conventional uh, um, uh, way that people are taught about autoimmune issues is that your immune cells begin attacking uh, otherwise healthy tissues we don't know why. Uh, there appears to be some genetic risk factor, maybe an infection of some type, maybe, and a host of other unknown environmental factors. Uh, because in twin studies, you are at slightly increased risk if you're a twin or a sibling uh, has an autoimmune condition, but you don't necessarily have it, even if you have two parents or an identical twin with an autoimmune condition. There's still a greater probability that you will not have it. So these other factors. 
but no one talked about you know diet, quality, stress, or sleep, or exercise. They just said take the disease modifying drugs. Uh, There's no cure. No cure. It's really just focused on treatment, and the primary intervention for treatment is maybe some drugs. Phys- primary drugs, maybe some physical therapy, depending on what people you know, are that, at. You know, and ironically enough, I had to refer myself to physical therapy uh, because I was like. I mean, I'm a former athlete, so I knew exercise would be really important, and I kept sending myself to physical therapy to be sure I was doing as much exercise and uh, as optimally as I could. So primarily uh, drugs. Primarily drugs. And the drugs are to uh, block the immune cell function. Now, To suppress the immune system. To suppress the immune cells so they can't attack you. And mind you, I was happy to take those drugs because I wanted to treat my disease aggressively, and so I was uh, very willing to do all of that. Uh, but now I, I also, with my functional medicine understanding and, and my own uh, clinical experience and my reading the science, we need our immune cells to repair and maintain our bodies. If I want to repair the myelin damage that's occurring, I need my immune cells to go in, mop up the damage, and supervise the repair. When you take uh, immune suppressants, you block the uh, repair that your brain's been attempting to do all of this time. So in traditional medical literature and the approach that doctors are taught that we need to bring in these immune suppressing drugs because if it's the immune system that's attacking our body that's causing this degradation, we have to suppress that. But in that process, we also end up suppressing our general immune system, which is important for all sorts of functions inside the body. Correct. So we need our immune cells to maintain repair all of our function. Um, Without that, you have accelerated aging increased vulnerability to infection, increased vulnerability to cancers, which are, of course, increased when you're taking immune-suppressing drugs. You have a higher rate of infection and cancers, and you'll have uh, accelerated uh, aging. Uh, And no one is talking to you about general wellness. No one's talking to you about, okay. So it's it's a mix of genetics, unknown environmental factors. So what we ought to have you do is, let's have you do all of the known and, and there's thousands of studies that will tell us what are the diet and lifestyle factors associated with improved health outcomes. We could have just said, you know what, we don't know, so let's have you do all these diet and lifestyle factors that we can that are associated with improved health, which is basically what I was doing uh, once I started reading the basic science myself. It's like, okay, I gotta do everything I can. Uh, and so, you know, in the summer of 07, I'm like, okay, I'm really on the knife's edge of catastrophe here. I have to do everything. So I went back to meditation. I was convincing my uh, physical therapist to add E-STEM to uh, get even more out of my exercise. I was reading the basic science and you know zeroing in on nutrition as well as I could. Then I had that big aha, like, I shouldn't be relying just on supplements. I should be structuring my diet as maximally nutrient-dense as I can using this template of nutrients as the most important ones that my brain needs. Let's talk about sleep. Please. You know, I, I was a very ambitious, um, uh, hardworking uh, young person. Uh, and so, and also my entire life, I've been easily activated so that it'd be hard to fall asleep, wake up early, hard to uh, fall back to sleep. Uh, and I thought, well, that's fine. There's a lot I want to do, you know, books to read, papers to write. Uh, and so I thought it was fine to get by with four hours of sleep a night. Well, it is not fine to have only four hours of sleep a night. Uh, and uh, inadequate sleep is a common, common problem for people with autoimmunity. Uh, and people in that pre, that, that uh, proto-arm state. And, you know, actually for, for many people uh, here, in America, in the Western world, we, we're not sleeping enough. Uh, and that increases our vulnerability. Absolutely. And, and just to connect those dots, prodome, right? Prodome is that area that you're talking about. You may not have a diagnosis, but it's the buildup. What's going on subclinically where your markers still may be off? You don't feel good. You're noticing things that don't even necessarily look like they could become autoimmune until you hear interviews like this but you are just not feeling good and you're not in an optimal state and you feel lethargic. You feel maybe tired. You feel like you can't focus. You're 
uh, if you're a woman, your menstrual cycle is maybe not uh, you know in the in the best place. You have really severe PMS symptoms. If you are uh, a man, you could even be suffering from erectile dysfunction. So, what are the things that are happening that are an indication that you're on your way to unfortunately something tragic happening if we don't get a chance to intervene? If, as you reflect on your life, are your symptoms gradually getting worse? Are you having more fatigue? Uh, do you need higher and higher doses of caffeine to get through the day? Are you exhausted? Are you more irritable, uh, more anxious, more depressed? And if you're honest with yourself, looking back over time, are you feeling like, you know, I'm not as healthy and vigorous as I was two years ago or three years ago? Um, that's a, certainly very troublesome. Uh, and so if you were seeing me um, as you, as a patient, I would certainly be asking about your health events, your life events, taking you through the functional medicine matrix, trying to identify what are your root causes and what can we do to focus on getting um, your biological systems, systems in better alignment. Uh, and we would try and help you make realistic um, goals and work step by step at improving your diet, uh, at uh, addressing sleep, if that's an issue, at addressing stress, if that's an issue, uh, at addressing movement. But you know, we have to make these changes step by step at a pace where you could actually be successful. I, I love that word step by step. And I have a feeling that this podcast is probably going to be called somewhere in the title. It's going to be step by step because it's so important to present the possibility. Your story starts yeah. the conversation and that's what you know you do a great job about because now people are seeing that, whoa, something that I didn't think was possible is now possible. And then gradually, as we start to cover these different pathways or factors, it can seem daunting. And really what you've done with the WALLS protocol is you've made it step-by-step. Step. So let's start there. Somebody comes to you and they say, Terry, I'm so inspired by your story. I want to get started down this pathway. You know, what's the first thing to be thinking about and how has that evolved your answer over the years as you've worked with more and more patients? Well, you know, interestingly enough, uh, I used to be very, very emphatic that we have to start with your diet, get your diet cleaned up uh, first. Uh, and then over time, particularly as I was working with the vets, I came to realize that uh, we have to get the inspiration in the mental game first so that they're willing to do the work because whether we start on the diet uh, or perhaps uh, stress or exercise whenever you change your behavior add a new desirable behavior or extinguish a undesirable behavior it takes effort it takes work i'm going to be a little uncomfortable that's going to take some effort uh, and helping people identify why they want to go on this journey. Uh, you know, what, is, what is it that I care so much about that I'm wanting to do this work? And then we have a conversation like, when it gets hard, what will be helpful to keep you going? So that's actually step number one. And it was my vets who taught me that. Then step number two is, okay, so I can tell you what I think is the best diet for you. Um, and we talk about stress and movement. And while I would like you to work, start with diet, I need to know is that where you where you want to start? Because we have to start where you want to start and where you are willing to do the work. I used to be very emphatic and say, you got to start on the diet. And I've come to realize for some people, uh, they need to start with a perhaps a meditative practice instead, or they may need to start with an exercise program. Because they can be successful there and they aren't ready to be successful with the diet. When I, when I was emphatic that people had to start where I thought they needed to start, um, I was not nearly as successful as when I let my patient guide where they wanted to focus first. That's a great, uh, that's a great reminder for everybody who's listening because we often have a idea in our head of how we want things to go. And in reality, even though we think, okay, I would love to start off with diet because I can maybe even along the process, I can lose a little bit of weight or I can feel, feel a little bit better. But sometimes you have something 
that can give you more momentum that you can see a quick win on. Or sometimes you have a blockage that is so strong, like a traumatic event that happened in your life. And there's there's not um, the strength in that moment until something else is addressed or, or at least un- given perspective to, to then be able to start. So I, I think it's just a, a really great reminder because so many people do come in through the pathway of diet because it's naturally okay. something that we interact with three times a day. What do you think are well, some of the nuanced thoughts that you really want to introduce to people, especially coming from the place where you were from the way that a lot of yeah. external people would say, you were doing all the health things. You were vegetarian. You were eating a low fat diet back then. You know, really, that's what a lot of what people were focused on. Yeah. And then I, I switched to the paleo diet. Right. And I was so no grain, no dairy. Uh, I reintroduced meat. That was a, a big deal. But I still declined for the next five years, although it was more slowly than when I was a vegetarian. So the paleo diet wasn't enough. Uh, I, for me, I, I think I was so, so ill. I mean, and clearly I was. I, I was profoundly ill. Uh, and it was when I focused on what to eat. <clears throat> so, Drew, I, I will tell people which diet I think is the most therapeutic for them. But then I'll, I'll follow up with, so uh, that's a big change from what you're eating now. Whatever we're going to have you do, I want to be sure you can be 100% successful, that you can actually do this uh, ideally for the next three months. And then we have a conversation. Do they think they can do it? And uh, if they can't, then we negotiate what it is they think they could do at 100% and for what time period so that they can be successful with the intervention that they're willing to do. Yeah, you know, and for, for some folks, they're like, you know, your walls level one, it just sounds too hard. And so we might do a Mediterranean diet first. Or they might say, yeah, even that's too hard. And so then we talk about, okay, um, how far could you go with taking sugar out of out of your diet? So uh, there's sort of a pre-walls work that, that people may do. But if, if they can do at least the walls level one, which is gluten-free, dairy-free, and, and preferably egg-free, at, at least for a couple of weeks, and ramping up the vegetables so that they can begin to feel like, okay, something's happening. And that was the approach I'd take with my vets. You know, if they're going to be in our group classes with me, they'd have to commit to 100% for 100 days, no, no gluten and no dairy, and the goal of nine cups of vegetables a day. And my, it was very funny. My vets would say, like, so that nine cups, is that uh, a month? So no, 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 that, that's a day. Yeah, uh, so a- we have these conversations like, oh my God. Uh, so for the vets, and if they were meat eaters, the, the basic recipe I would give them say, okay, take a couple of pieces of bacon, fry them in the skillet to the desired level of doneness, take the, take the bacon out, put your vegetables in, stir it around uh, for two minutes, uh, and uh, serve, you chop up your bacon and have your vegetables. And if the vegetables are bitter, add a tablespoon of lemon juice. Uh, and if they're still bitter, double the bacon and try again. And, and, the vets would, and, and we would make uh, bacon and greens for them. I would have them eat the kale raw. So they understood like, yep, that's really quite bitter. We'd cook the um, bacon and greens together, serve that, and they'd go like, oh, my God, that is delicious. So that made it possible for them to realize vegetables could, in fact, be delicious. You see, when we went low fat, by, by taking away the fat, these, these strong flavored vegetables had become bitter. Yeah, you're talking about just to interject. You're talking about the society when we when the society went through the low fat craze. Um, 
we, we, uh, please continue. I just wanted to make sure people knew that yes. you weren't talking about your protocol. You were talking about society, particularly uh, in society, America. When society went low fat in the 1960s. It took a generation of, of children and, and families away from vegetables because the vegetables were so bitter. Uh, then you could sort of compensate with a lot of sugar to try and make it more, more tolerable. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the consequence was the vegetable consumption went way down. Uh, sugar consumption went way up. Obesity rates went way up. Uh, mental health problems went way up. Autoimmune issues went way up. Uh, it, there's actually a very interesting paper that uh, recently is uh, reading about the uh, differences between vegetables with a strong flavor in terms of a higher polyphenol content uh, and a more favorable impact on epigenetic uh, markers with lower uh, in, infl inflammation markers. So there's there's a huge benefit for us for having these strongly flavored uh, vegetables uh, and foods. What I love about the point you just shared is that it's not just about what not to eat, although that's part of the conversation. You just listed three things there that are very important specifically for people that are dealing with autoimmune, but even if people who are dealing with you know, some symptoms that would be on their way to autoimmune if they don't have a diagnosis. And you talked about gluten, dairy, and, and eggs. But you also said it's not just about what we remove, it's about what we add in. And from our last interview, and you hinted at it a little bit, I remember really two to three uh, foods that are so underrated and missing in our society, and yet they were a game changer for you. One you already mentioned, which was bitters. The next one you you talked about, which was the quantity of fiber, which parallels into into bitters, right? So that nine cups of uh, vegetables, uh, you know, a day, not a month, a day. And then the <laughs> other one that we didn't chat about was organ meat. Now we'll get to organ meat yeah. in a second because you were a big proponent of that, and especially um, I felt uh, very motivated myself. I am a was a lifelong vegetarian all the way up until the age of 20, uh, 26, 27 years old, even being vegan for many years, thinking that I was doing the right thing for me. And at some point in time, what was working great stopped, stopped working. Even though I didn't have autoimmune, even though I didn't have any things like that, I, I had severe gastrointestinal issues and I started looking elsewhere. And then that's when I found functional medicine. So we'll get to organ meat in a second, but I want to tease out the nine cups of vegetables, which is a core central part of your protocol, help us understand, you know, why is our grandmother's advice of eating your veggies, but with fat, so crucial to the part of recovery for your journey and many other people? Well, you know, it was, it was interesting when I uh, started really focused on what I need to be eating. Uh, and I ramped up my greens in such a huge way. And I just had this immense craving for greens. Uh, and I just add in, uh, there's uh, onions, cabbage, mushroom family, and then things that are deeply colored. And as I taught my vets how to do this, it, it's mostly a, a male practice. I didn't want them hungry. So I said, you know, you know, you know six to 12 ounces of meat, and then nine cups of vegetables, and then go back to eating your meat. So the goal was to not have people be hungry. If, if someone's very petite, um, you know, four foot 11, she's not gonna be able to eat nine cups. So my advice to her is, you know, get in your, your two palm sized servings of meat, and then greens, the sulfur category and the colored category proportionally. Uh, that way they're, they're getting uh, some of the uh, polyphenols, they're getting all, all those carotenoids, uh, and, getting, and could I interject for a second? A lot of people have heard this word polyphenols and they may not be understanding like what, what's happening as a mechanism in the body. Why are these oh, sure. colors that are part of vegetables and, and fruits and the ones that you recommend, especially for people in you know the walls protocol, like the ones that are sort of lower in, in, in lectins and other things, maybe less likely to cause gut irritation. Why is it like what's actually happening in the body and specifically in the gut that these yeah. these polyphenols are actually doing? Well, we are getting closer to understanding this uh, through metabolomics. Uh, what's happening is 
we eat, we eat this food, the trillions of bacteria in our bowels also eat the food that we've eaten, and then they metabolize it, and they metabolize each other's metabolites. These compounds get into our bloodstream, and we're now uh, beginning to measure the metabolome, that is, uh, the further uh, metabolites, tens of thousands of metabolites that are in the uh, stool, the tears, uh, the blood, uh, the urine, uh, vaginal secretions. And we're looking at these, some of the pathways are pathways that you and I can run because they're part of human physiology. But there are also a lot of compounds that you and I can't run the chemical reactions. It is the bacteria in our bowels that are running these chemical reactions on the food that we eat. And these compounds get into our bloodstream. And we're, we're now beginning to understand how these bacterial metabolites get into our bloodstream and what the relationship is between those metabolites and the risk of heart disease, the risk of cancer, the risk of infection, the risk of mental health, the, uh, that's not good mental health, uh, and the risk of autoimmunity. There'll be further and further research. These polyphenols, these carotenoids, are substrates for all of these, um, mole these molecular reactions that will happen with our bacteria. We are an ecosystem. And, you know, our, our ancestral mothers and our fathers, but this is really a, a maternal line, there would be random mutations that occur because that occurs in life. And if the mutation for a step was no longer effective, but our bacterial bacteria that are in our gut could still do that step, that was at that point that molecular pathway, the genetic information for that step, got exported from our ancestral mother to our, her ancestral microbiome. And that's how you and I have about 25,000 genes, but we have about 5 million genes from, in, from all of the microbes in our gut. And it's a rich diet full of diverse plants without a lot of sugar, without a lot of processed food that feeds the microbiome to get all of those metabolites that we need for optimal health. That's what those polyphenols are doing for us. That's what all those carotenoids are doing for us. And that's why um, the foods that are so helpful are the are, um, uh, herbs, uh, the strong uh, flavored fruits and vegetables, because the things that are sweet and starchy have been cultivated and bred to be sweet and starchy. And those useful compounds that have been feeding our microbiome that are so helpful for how we run our, the chemistry of life uh, are, are, are present in, in diminishing amounts in these uh, vegetables and fruits that have been bred for sweetness and for weight and size. Yeah, which is really actually interesting. I remember hearing... Uh... A report on uh, NPR about the challenge that modern banana farmers are facing in Hawaii because the banana it has been so uh, hybridized and bred to be sweeter and sweeter. Mother Nature always likes an equilibrium, and one of the challenges with modern banana plants because of how they've been bred is that they're so susceptible to viruses because a lot of the minerals that were normally part of them that helped them wait off bacteria and viruses are no longer there. And instead they have more sugar content. So it's very difficult to keep these trees alive in the first place because they're so sensitive to pathogens and viruses. And in a similar way, we're seeing this with ourselves as human beings. If we become yeah. too sweet on the inside, our metabolic health isn't good. Our blood sugar is too high. We don't have all the key nutrients that are there to protect ourselves and more importantly, you know, even our bacteria. We start to become vulnerable to opportunistic uh, things, even like COVID-19. With functional medicine, I now had a framework to organize my thinking. Uh, and so a much more comprehensive approach. 
that validated, yes, make time to do your daily meditation. You need to uh, prioritize that. I um, it certainly reinforced the power of exercise and then all the molecular pathways that exercise uh, was benefiting. Um, and then oh, as I was getting to the root cause and thinking back uh, that I needed to address <clears throat> mitochondrial function, because that's what I was really zeroed in on, uh, was I, I have to support those uh, mitochondria and detox pathways. I would eventually realize that the microbiome is really uh, a big thing that I was supporting with all of those uh, vegetables, all of that fiber, uh, and that increased uh, diversity, and then uh, uh, spending more time stressing uh, the fermented vegetables as well. So I, I would continue to refine things over the next year, but it, it was the framework, the more comprehensive look at what I was doing, and you know, steadily growing confidence that I am onto something. And then when I got onto my bike, I'm like, who knows how much recovery is possible? Clearly, the, the present understanding of multiple sclerosis is incorrect, is incomplete. The present understanding of secondary progressive multiple sclerosis is incomplete. I, and that, um, I mean, I think like, well, yeah, maybe jogging will be possible. Uh, biking apparently is, again. I, and so the 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 possibilities. And then, you know, in the meantime, in my traumatic brain injury clinic, you know, when I first got assigned to that clinic, the, the treatment was, well, we'll just give you psych drugs to control your rage, and we'll just see what happens. And then I come to clinic, well, like, to all these poor uh, men and ladies who were uh, uh, having immense suffering, I'm like, there's a lot we can do. I'm gonna teach you how to eat, I'm gonna talk about exercising, we're gonna talk about meditation, and you're gonna get your life uh, turned around. And we started turning people's lives around. At first, my colleagues were very, very unhappy with uh, my approach. And what do you think was the primary thing that came up for them, that you're breaking the mold and now other patients are asking them questions? Or, you know, I'm sure well, there's a, co a bunch of factors, but what were you noticing from them? Uh, well, the first thing, I uh, I got called to the chief of staff's office. He said, you know, Terry, people, what are you doing? People are complaining. <laughs> Um, and so... Patients told, or other doctors? Other docs. No, patients were loving. Patients were thrilled. That they, um, so I ended up having to um, go meet with a director for the Complementary Alternative Medicine who taught me how to uh, talk about this more precisely in my clinical notes and in the public. So I was careful to not overstate my claims to say that I'm just improving cellular physiology, watching for a reduced need for medication uh, so we don't end up with you being over-medicated if your cells improve their function. Uh, so that I had to learn how to speak uh, carefully. They're teaching you how to be more politically correct. Absolutely. But, <laughs> but um, it, it is important to maintain those relationships with your colleagues. Of course, you're and a team. To, and to help patients understand that, no, I'm not curing them, but I'm let, letting them uh, treat their cells in a more effective way, and their cells are rebuilding them by correctly made molecule by correctly made molecule. And as that happens, their need for blood pressure meds goes down, their need for blood sugar meds goes down, their need for pain meds goes down, and everyone starts being less irritable. And they start getting along a whole lot better with their colleagues at work and their family. Similar to your situation, if I could interject, you never say that you're cured from MS. Oh, I'm never, you just say that oh, your not. symptoms have been reduced to such a big degree and your body function Correct. has returned. Now, oh, exactly. If I get exposed uh, to gluten, dairy, or eggs, my face pain will turn on. Or, you know, if I have too much stress, if I take too many flights uh, in a month, so my toxin load is too great, my face pain will turn on. So uh, I manage my disease. I always have those that genetic vulnerability, um, but as long as I do all of my self cares, I do very very well. Do you use the word recovery that you've recovered from MS? That you like? What's the word that you use to describe the transformation that you've had? So I, I've certainly have recovered um, a, a great deal of function. The question is, uh, am I 
a normal 64 year old, my kids will say, mom, you'll never be normal. And I think that's true. But when I saw my neurologist uh, last week, he said, well, let's sort of take stock of where you're at. So what's the most rigorous athletic thing you can do? So, okay, how about I'll start doing push-ups for you? We'll see how, and so I did 10 push-ups for my toes. So, okay, well, that's pretty good. You can stop now. Uh, I said, <laughs> okay, uh, how about vertical leaps? How many, so, so I did 10 vertical leaps. I said, okay, you can stop now. That, so, okay, uh, I'll stand on one foot. So after a minute, I said, okay, why don't you stop now? I, I think we clearly have established that you're in excellent shape. I don't know what a normal 64-year-old American woman could do in terms of push-ups, but probably not 10, and I bet most of them can't do 10 vertical leaps, and they probably can't stand on one foot uh, for longer than a minute. Um, but I, I'm not as athletic as I, you know, I had hoped when I was uh, a young athlete, I was hoped to be running marathons, uh, be the white-haired grandmother uh, running marathons, passing the youngsters, so I, I'm not quite up to that yet, but I'm still hopeful. <laughs> I'm still hopeful. Yeah. So we wanted to show this photo. It was one of those moments when you were biking. And then together you have the before and after photo and now, individuals can see. It, it, what is remarkable about that is, so in 2007, I could not sit up in a regular chair. I have brain fog uh, and I have um, severe pain. One year later, I'm able to do an 18.5 mile bike ride. My brain fog is gone, my pain is gone. As long as I continue to follow my self-cares, I'm doing very well, I continue to get stronger. If my self-cares get derailed, my pain comes back. And this is the journey that you wrote about in your book, The mm -hmm. Walls Protocol, which dives into much of the story that we talked about over here mm -hmm how it happened, starting first with those face pains that you had early in medical school from stress and other factors that were going on in life yes. and the factors that you grew up with as, an, you know, as a child, antibiotic exposure, dietary, other things like that. Um, and in addition to your story and your recovery process, a detailed step-by-step -step protocol that you followed, but that can be helpful not just for patients with the same diagnosis of progressive MS, but potentially for other mm -hmm. autoimmune Correct. diseases. In fact, you started getting a lot of people writing in saying yeah. that they were doing your protocol for things like Parkinson's. Parkinson's. What are some um, other examples of chronic diseases or conditions that people had that they were noticing that they were getting significantly better or not declining as fast when they were following your WALS protocol? So um, other autoimmune problems, things like uh, systemic lupus, fibro uh, fibromyalgia, uh, psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, um, uh, autoimmune thyroid disease. Uh, then uh, we also have other neurologic issues like Parkinson's, uh, mental health issues, anxiety, depression, uh, bipolar, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, then we've had um, uh, myasthenia, uh, uh, diabetes, obesity, uh, heart disease, uh, chronic pain. Uh, you know, the, the VA became so impressed with the work that I was doing in the traumatic brain injury clinic and in the primary care clinic, uh, they asked me to create uh, a, a clinic that was devoted to doing medicine the way I wanted to do it, and we called it the Therapeutic Lifestyle Clinic. Uh, and I went to the pain clinic, I went to primary care, and I said, you know, give me your most challenging patients, but what they need to know they're not getting drugs from me. We're just gonna do diet and lifestyle. Uh, and so the most common uh, diagnoses or issues that I was helping people with were pain, brain fog, uh, and uh, mood issues. Uh, and they'd come with a variety of diagnoses. It might be old war injuries. It might be uh, back pain, an autoimmune problem, mental health problem, obesity, diabetes. But the most common symptom that people were, were troubled with uh, was pain, uh, brain fog, uh, some mood issues, uh, and then of course their underlying disease states. And we'd put them basically on the WALS protocol. Uh, I would personalize it uh, uh, to address their uh, issues. We had such success, I ended up having to uh, switch things over to a group classes because we had, I wanted to help as many people as possible, and we had uh, long waiting lines to get in. Uh, and the VA, because it has an electronic medical system, 
uh, was able to uh, monitor uh, blood pressure, uh, blood sugar uh, use, lab values, and, and saw that we were consistently improving blood pressure, improving blood sugars, needing fewer drugs. Um, it was it was really uh, very very satisfying. You know, sometimes I've shared your story. Just I'm in conversation. I have so many friends, uh, family members that are uh, physicians or in research or in the medical system in some shape or form. Or I'm on vacation somewhere and I'm just chatting with somebody about the work that I do. And or I come across somebody who has uh, MS and I'm talking about your story. And oftentimes when somebody is in the space of research or a physician, I can immediately see this sort of you know, uh, not always, but often glance of, and then sometimes a comment of, well, there's no evidence that immediately the jump to, oh, there's no evidence well, yes, to I love show that. that this actually works. And so who knows, this could be just her story. This could be anecdotal. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that sometimes, well, first of all, you are working on a ton of research and there's mm -hmm. research that's out yep, there. Yep, We're going to talk yep. about that in a second, but I want to talk about the first part of your story is that I think sometimes people forget that the way that research gets funded, especially when it comes to lifestyle interventions, like the research that you're doing, is you shared your story. You did a case study. And mm -hmm. that case study turned into the- Case series. Case series. Turned into a feasibility trial. Feasibility trial. Turned into randomized control trial. Turned into randomized parallel group trial. Um, so yes, th there's a, a definite sequence. Um, it, it is, you know, people, it, when I first recovered, my neurologist said, you know, Terry, I get so many calls. I, you know, I'm so glad you went to see uh, the Cleveland Clinic because people keep accusing me of being incompetent, saying that you couldn't possibly have MS. And I get to say, no, no, she saw the best center in the country. Uh, so uh, she has <laughs> MS. I, but then, of course, someone can say that you do prospective clinical trials, and you've gotten uh, very nice results in others as well. And I want to add one other element to it. You know, you're in this field, you're in this space where you have access to do these trials, mm -hmm. the support of the colleagues through Correct. you earning that support. But in addition to that, you also based the protocol on first, of course, your own experience, what you were noticing getting better or not, but that was also based on research that was out there. Oh, absolutely. Now, it's all science-based. That, that's all science-based, but it, you don't have to have a big clinical trial on MS, not that that's not useful and we want that and that's what you're doing, to begin to make improvements and to see if you notice or a patient notice a difference. You might be working with a doctor who mm -hmm. says, look, these are the pros and cons. This is what the research says. These are what the animal models show out there. This is what pathways it's linked to or the core issues that are there. Correct. I think it's worth trying. And, and what you always want to be doing is judging the uh, risk of the intervention. Uh, how risky is the intervention? So as I was doing things, I was you know assessing how, how uh, worrisome were these supplements. And so I was checking them always uh, against the safety data to verify that they were safe. And then I could make a decision, how risky would it be to go back to a daily meditation? That's pretty safe. Um, how risky was it to do physical therapy every day? Well, I've been doing that for years uh, under uh, my therapist, uh, so that's pretty safe. Adding electrical stimulation, that was under my therapist's direction, so that's pretty safe. Uh, redesigning my paleo diet to stress a more nutrient-dense diet, again, that's pretty safe. Um, a, a lot of the dietitians will say, you know, when you do a paleo diet, any diet that excludes uh, a, a whole food groups, puts you at risk for nutrient deficiencies, and, and that would be terrible for you. Uh, so, we, when I, I uh, wrote these uh, analyses, uh, to analyze our diet using rigorous uh, registered dietitian uh, uh, nutrient software. Um, we published it in high impact registered dietitian uh, nutrition journals, analysis of the Wall's diet, and it's no surprise superior to the uh, US governmental dietary guidelines uh, for many, many of the nutrients. Uh, and so we've uh, published that, and I uh, update that uh, in my book. Uh, so I, I think it's important for us to be skeptical 
I think it's important for us to evaluate carefully these interventions. Are they risky or not? And you can decide, uh, I want to wait for randomized double-blind controlled trials. Or you can decide that vegetables are pretty safe, meditation's pretty safe, exercise is pretty safe, uh, supplements supervised by your personal physician uh, is pretty safe. Um, and and the, you know, the other thing that's exciting, Drew, is when I first started talking about diet and exercise as critical to protecting your brain, the neurology community, and that was back when my uh, TED Talk went viral in 2011, and when my book came out in 2014, they were very upset. Mm. They said, you know, diet has nothing to do with it. You know, you got a terrible disease, eat what you want. But now, you know, the science has caught up. The microbiome research has caught up. The epigenetics research has caught up. Um, and now the leading neuroscientists are saying, we have to preserve your brain. Even if you take disease-modifying drugs, you're at high risk of developing early cognitive decline, at high risk of having accelerated brain atrophy. You need to eat a nutrient-dense diet. You need to do a stress-reducing pro- program. You need to do daily exercise. You should monitor your vitamin D level. You should know your homocysteine status. And you know what? It sounds like they read my book. <laughs> <laughs> the landscape of the conversation has changed. Has in changed a way, a lot. yes. Those same researchers and physicians are thinking a lot more holistically because they understand that every part of the body affects another part of the body. And if we don't keep that in mind, it's not enough to just look at what is this one drug doing to improve this one thing that we're looking at when it comes to this disease, but what are the other aspects? So that leads me to the question of, you know, you were sharing in your story that in addition to the things you were focusing on adding, you also were off of those drugs that were yeah. given to you in the beginning. When, at what point in time in the journey, uh, from the time that you were in a wheelchair, were you off all of those medications? So uh, in uh, 2007, I started all this stuff. I'm on Celsept, which is a disease-modifying drug. I'm recovering, I'm walking around. I, uh, in March, or maybe it was the first week of April, I went to see my neurologist uh, and I told him that I wanted to go off the disease-modifying drugs. He goes, you know, I, I think that's fine, Terry. I, well, first off, he, uh, he was stunned when he saw me walk into his office because the last time he'd seen me, I'd been in the wheelchair looking really bad. Um, so he was thrilled. Uh, he got an MRI. He was so disappointed that my MRI had not changed. And then I said, you know, it was probably foolish to think that it would because those are really old lesions. So the thing is that your brain isn't shrinking. You don't have new lesions. Uh, and yes, I, we should still taper you and take you off those drugs. Uh, so we did, and I've been off uh, all disease-modifying drugs since uh, uh, the second week of April. I'm still on gabapentin, although now I'm on a, a very tiny dose. Uh, I've, att- I've attempted to go entirely off the gabapentin, but my face pain comes back. Um, so I, I have scarred my spinal cord. Um, uh, so likely, I, I will be on a very low dose gabapentin forever because when that pain comes on, it's so horrific that I'm just like taking uh, 400 milligrams of gabapentin for the rest of my life is like no big deal. I'm happy to do that. And this brings up the larger point, which is that when people work with, even you're a physician, you were working with your doctors to oh, decide yeah. what medications were there. But I'm hearing, and I want to say it back to you, and you correct me if I'm wrong that a big part of your recovery, in addition to the things that you were doing, was knowing when to get off the drugs in the right order. Correct, correct. You know, a lot of people will reach out and say, I just discovered your protocol, I'm gonna stop my drugs. And that's the wrong answer. That's absolutely the wrong answer. You implement the protocol, and you may, if you have great response, uh, have be able to have a future conversation, say, I'd like to taper and get off my drugs. We, we don't know what the appropriate time frame is. Uh, it, uh, it's based on every patient and every their patient, process. It, uh, and uh, you want to, it depends on your disease. Um, do you have MS? Do you have lupus? Do you have fibromyalgia? Do you have inflammatory bowel disease? Um, so you need to be monitored for your disease activity. Uh, and then uh, things slowly tapered at the time that it's appropriate. And then you need to know that lifestyle, your self-cares are now your potent disease-modifying drugs. And if you, let's say in two years, you're feeling so great, you think, ah, I don't need to do this anymore. Uh, at my, I'm at my nephew's wedding um, and I wanna have wedding cakes, so I do. And then I have a severe rebound flare. 
Your neurologist will say, see, I told you, you can't stop the drugs. Mm. And I would say, see, I told you, you can't cheat. Your lifestyle is your disease-modifying therapy. If you stop it, expect a rebound. Just like if you stop your potent disease-modifying drugs, you expect a rebound. When it comes to getting excited about, you know, one of your, uh, uh, we've talked about diet, we talked about fasting, and as we said in the beginning of the interview, the Walls Protocol is so much more than those things, although those things are a huge, huge baseline foundation and often where people first get started. When it comes to getting people excited about things, let's talk about the category of movement. How have you found, with all the research that's out there on how, just for a term that people can you know normally use, exercise, but really we're talking about movement and mm-hmm. its benefits that are there, how have you found that you help people get excited about integrating that into their larger protocol? You know, if we can come up with a strategy that fits into their day, uh, it, whether it is adding more walking while they're at work or during work, uh, walking with their family, um, do they fit it into before work, after work? Uh, so it's a conversation about what does your day look like? How can we fit it in? And what are the activities that are fun for you? Uh, and so it's it's different for everyone. Um, driving to a gym takes a lot of time. Uh, and that can be hard for people to do. Although driving to a gym to meet friends and family, uh, it's a social event, can be immensely rewarding uh, and fun. Uh, walking with your spouse on a daily basis or with your kids on a daily basis uh, gives you, uh, or with friends, gives you that social contact. So again, it's a conversation with the person, what is fun and what can fit into your day. I was it listening to- be, It must be fun. It must be something they enjoy. Yeah, you have to have a, some sense of feeling like uh, a draw towards it. Even if it's challenging, it has to be fun. It has to be that fun element that's there. I was listening to a practitioner who's pretty well known. You, I don't know if you're connected with her or not, but Rhonda Patrick, and uh, you know, oh, writes yeah. and and shares a lot of things in this in this space. Actually, yes, I think I saw an interview with you guys from years ago when you were first just starting mm-hmm. off. It might have even been before your book was published, or it was when right when your book was published. But Rhonda was recently on the Joe Rogan podcast this week, and I was watching their interview together because I always enjoy, you know, her sharing uh, her knowledge because she's so deeply read. She was sharing the story that, you know, my mom, uh, this is Rhonda talking, Dr. Rhonda Patrick said, my mom is in pretty poor health and it's just so hard, even though I live and breathe this, it's so hard to really incorporate any aspect of movement. So a few years ago, what I decided again, Rhonda talking about her mom is that I got her a sauna and, you know, sometimes you, you know, people don't have the means to do that. You can go to a friend's sauna. And I thought at least if I could get some good stress, right? The positive stress, same type of stress that comes from, you know, working out in her life on a regular basis, that's at least something. So what are your thoughts about that? That, you know, there's some people that are just in a place where they just not going to move at all, right? Could there be other options and could sauna be one of those things that they can incorporate? And is there anything else like that? So whenever you're in a sauna or in a a hot tub, your blood vessels dilate by the surface of your skin, which increases the uh, blood flow through your heart. That is a very nice, gentle um, cardiovascular exercise if you tolerate heat. Now, people with MS often do not tolerate heat at all. And so for them, uh, they they probably would not tolerate uh, a sun. And actually for years, I did very, very poorly with heat. Uh, and, and very poorly if I got any kind of febrile illness. As I recovered, I tolerated heat. I enjoyed saunas. I got myself a sauna. And in fact, I take a sauna uh, probably five to six days a week. And I can take it quite comfortably up to 125, 140 degrees. Amazes my neurologist. But, you know, it, it's a great hormetic heat stress. And it's gentle aerobic exercise. That's great. Is there anything else like that? You know, we're just talking about the tools that are in the toolbox. Are there other things that you have done yourself or recommended to other people that fall in that same category? 
cold hormetic stress. So adding a cold shower, taking a cool bath, uh, taking a ice bath, and this is all, you know, Wim Hof, we'll certainly talk with you about that as well. <clears throat> uh, again, because we live in controlled environments, air conditioning, central heat, we live in a very, very narrow uh, temperature environment, which has decreased our metabolic resilience. So giving ourselves more exposures uh, to expand the temperature, both on the upper and lower end, will improve our metabolic resilience. I, I, I recommend it very much. I love that. Both great options. You know, piggybacking off of this topic of metabolic resilience, let's dive deeper into some of your own understandings and emphasis when it comes to, um, you know, you've always talked about metabolic health with autoimmune, you know, patients or even people that are on their way, but even more so recently we were chit chatting before and you were talking about, you know, the importance of blood sugar and balanced blood sugar as one of those things to pay attention to, in addition to, you know, what not to eat, what are the superfoods to eat, you know, how does blood sugar which then connects to metabolic health and insulin sensitivity, how does that um, make autoimmune better or worse? People with a serious autoimmune condition are much more likely to have insulin resistance, central obesity, prediabetes, and diabetes, uh, and also heart disease. If we have insulin resistance, um, again, that increases and accelerates the damage from your autoimmune disease. And many, and we, and we see this uh, very much in all of our clinical trials, that people with MS often don't realize that they've developed insulin resistance. They may not realize that they're pre-diabetic. And we've had several folks not realize that they had already become diabetic. This is an epidemic uh, across our country. Uh, so certainly one of the things I recommend is that you ask your personal physician to get a, a fasting insulin uh, and a fasting glucose uh, and sort out, do you have insulin resistance? If you have insulin resistance, then actually it would be, uh, the next thing to do is to get a continuous glucose monitor or a uh, glucose uh, finger strip, uh, finger stick monitor, and monitor your blood sugar, and get better glycemic control, lower your insulin level, and this is where a lower carb diet, um, a, a lower um, uh, time restricted feeding, intermittent fasting can be really very helpful. And you know, just to connect it back to your story and you sharing very openly, uh, you know, in this interview and past interviews, you know, you were talking about uh, your battle well before you were diagnosed with progressive MS and, you know, in the wheelchair and dealing with all this pain, you had endometriosis, you know, that was one of the things early on. And we know now more and more data is coming out there is that endometriosis is, is so connected to, uh, you know, metabolic health and, and insulin sensitivity, brain disease, yep. insulin resistance. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> and so, uh, no doubt, had I not discovered all of this, I would have, you know, uh, the loss protocol and changed my diet. Because previously as a vegetarian, I had a hot, very high carb diet. That, that certainly would have accelerated the insulin resistance and put me at great risk for prediabetes uh, and diabetes, even though I was quite trim. Um, that is epidemic. Even if you are trim, you have a high carb diet, you may be unaware that you are developing insulin resistance and at significant risk for prediabetes, diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, and heart disease. And all of that will accelerate and worsen your autoimmune disease if you have that. Yeah, I come from an Indian background and you know, South Asians, uh, especially here in America, but now it's globally as the American diet is being exported all over the world, they suffer for some of the worst metabolic rates, even the ones um, who are vegetarian. You know, much of my family still is vegetarian, and many mm -hmm. folks are being diagnosed, 
increasingly as the generations kind of continue with autoimmune conditions. And, um, it's, it's, it's a funny thing, but I think that your message of even, uh, uh, you know, the nine cups of f- fruits and vegetables, it's just as important for vegetarians, because as you know, you were a vegetarian. It's so often that even vegetarians themselves don't get a lot of raw vegetables. They're more of a yeah. carbitarian. That is true. Absolutely. I want to return back to something that we brought up in the beginning, which you uh, were, were sharing about. And I've seen some videos on Instagram and Facebook about you talking about this. And that is the mindset piece. How is it, how is it and why is it so important that figuring out your why is, is often the first step when you go down this pathway of healing? You know, again, this is something my vets taught me. One of the things that we did, <clears throat> you know, we would have the intake class. People would come back every month. And then we had skills classes. And you could come back forever to the skills class. <clears throat> and we had uh, classes about cooking, lots of fun. Uh, we had all sorts of movement classes, yoga, tai chi, uh, strength building. <clears throat> and we had... Uh, our health behavior folks come and they talk to us about, excuse me, purpose. Uh, They talked to us about the hero's journey. They talked about uh, why, um, what you want your health for. And what I saw from the vets was these mental, uh, emotional, spiritual classes were uh, their favorite classes and they were the most impactful. And so I began incorporating those lessons into my intake uh, in our uh, monthly classes as well. And that's because it takes work to create a new habit. No matter how much I, I want to do that, it's going to take work. Uh, it's going to take work to extinguish the harmful habits. And to be willing to do the work, to grind it in over the month that it'll take to get this habit established, it is so much easier if I've had clarity as to why I want to go on this journey. Uh, you know, a question I love asking is, the house's smoke is rolling out the windows. There's a little bit, you can see a few flames. Is there something or someone you care so deeply about that you would run into that house without thinking? to save that person or that something. And mm-hmm. tell me what that is. In nearly always, you know, people know immediately who that is or occasionally who that, what that something is. If they don't have an answer to that question, actually then I would send them off to um, our mental health department uh, because uh, they're probably suffering from Uh, depression and loneliness uh, in a big way. We have to get them connected. If they have someone that they care so deeply about, then the next questions we have is, now, if your health could moderately improve, how would your relationship with that person change? What would you do? And so that's a conversation. Uh, Then the next conversation is okay. If your health could moderately improve, what physical celebration would you do with that person? Now we have an attraction, we have a purpose, we have meaning. And we put that at the center of what we check in every month. That they they want to be there for your son's or daughter's graduation or wedding or they want to do this big hike with their son or their daughter or their spouse. Uh, and what do we do to help them achieve that goal? And then we have the conversation. Okay. So what's the next small step? It's so simple. And yet it's so profound because not wanting something or trying to avoid something. Sure. That can get you started, but it's often not the thing that can keep you going. There has to be something that you're being pulled towards 
in addition to not wanting something like not wanting disease, I don't want to be sick. You hear that so often. Great. That can be a central part of it, but there has to be a greater why that pulls you along. For comparison, can you share those for you when you were at a place where you were looking for hope in your life and your journey? What were those things that were pulling you forward? What were the things and the celebrations that you would do with those that you loved if your health moderately improved? Yeah, before entering medical school as an athlete, I um, I did wilderness travel, uh, full contact, free sparring, uh, ran marathons, bike marathons, ski marathons. Uh, When I had my kids, I assumed that I'd teach my kids resilience and all the uh, skills they would need to be successful in wilderness and sports. You know, by the time, you know, my son was 10, my daughter was seven, it was very clear that I wouldn't be teaching them sports. I wouldn't be doing wilderness travel. And I was having to continually reimagine what parenting would be like. Uh, and what, what I was thinking about, Drew, was, okay, my, my kids are watching. And I can either model that when life gets difficult, you complain and give up. Or I could model that I keep doing everything that I possibly can. And so I was doing my little physical therapy every day. You know, I'd swim in the pool uh, every day. And then I, when I couldn't swim anymore, I'm doing my little water aerobics. And my mantra was, your kids are watching. And then the other thing that I was um, uh, thinking deeply about was, you know, uh, yeah, my kids are still very young. I want to see them graduate from high school. Uh, and so my goal at that point was I'm just going to still be alive. I had completely and you know, accepted that you know, with progressive MS, secondary progressive MS, functions once lost do not come back. And it was very clear, nothing was coming back. I'd had my illness seven years or 27 years, if I counted the trigeminal neuralgia, nothing ever got better. Despite incredibly aggressive treatment that I had, including Tizabri. Uh, and um, interestingly enough, you know, when in 2008, you know, I, I had redesigned my paleo diet. I added meditation. I added e-stim. I was still doing uh, my physical therapy. And my physical therapist was like, well, you know, you are getting stronger. And he had me lifting weights. You know, I'm walking uh, with a cane. I didn't know what any of it meant, Drew. Because I had accepted that, you know, I, recovery was not possible. And, you know, I, I remember in April... Uh, walking around the block with my wife, Jackie, saying, you know, I think I can try riding my, my bike again. I said, well, you know, you are doing really good. Um, you know, maybe in the fall, if things keep going well, we could, we could uh, get the bike out for you. Well, a couple weeks later, it was uh, Mother's Day. And it was... I decided I wanted to ride my bike. So I, I'm out in the garage, fussing with the seat because my son had been riding and he's six foot five. So I was, you know, pulling the seat down. And my family hears me, they run out. We have this emergency family meeting. Uh, and fortunately, uh, <clears throat> Jack lets me, you know, take the bike out. We all get into position because she decides that uh, we can try. And you know, I get, on, I get on the bike, she gives it all clear, and I bike around the block. You know, uh, um, you know, my kids are crying. Jackie's crying, and I'm crying. Of course, whenever I tell this story, uh, you know, I get pretty emotional because that was when I understood, like, oh, my God, who, who knows 
how much recovery might be possible, that the current understanding of secondary progressive MS is incomplete. And that by doing what I was doing, things were happening in my brain and my spinal cord that no one expected. Mm. I hadn't planned on any celebrations because I didn't know that it was possible I could get better. But now I tell my patients, plan on celebrations, plan on the possibility that things could improve, that by addressing your environment as thoroughly as you can, by addressing diet, by addressing sleep, stress, movement, and we'll do this step by step, step by achievable small step, that your body will begin doing the chemistry of life correctly. And the whole network of biochemical reactions, as they begin to be in better and better alignment, and molecules are made correctly in your cells and in your tissues, perhaps for the first time in years, you'll look at the mirror and you realize you're getting younger and your family and friends will say, oh my God, you look 10 years younger. And your doctors and your physicians and your physical therapists will say like, you're getting stronger. We could advance your exercises. And you'll be able to have celebrations that a year ago you would have thought were not at all possible. And we see that. We see that time and time again. A powerful reminder about just how crucial mindset is to the whole aspect. And even when you're doing everything right, as I'm sure you've seen with some of your patients that have followed the protocol, but you are missing out on the mindset piece. You are just a few life events away from being derailed and setting back. So that mindset piece is uh, insurance on everything else that we're paying attention to. And I'm so glad that it's getting the attention that it deserves by people like you talking about it. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. Any movement can be modified. And, and then you set your own pace, you know? If there's, a, if there's a practice where you're just holding your arms up like that and it's like, it's too much, you know, you can lower it down. You know, 